we're particularly attentive to the expansion of vocabulary because that allows for the expansion of thought. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudoua, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Chief Marketing Officer. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. Well, Andrew, it's been a week, and now we're here at part two. Do you remember what we're supposed to talk about? I do. Oh, good. Because in truth, Julie, we're recording this on the same day. Oh, you gave away our secret. It's true, but everybody already knew that. But I'm really looking forward to this because last week you said you are going to talk about memories are stored in places other than the brain? Well, there is some evidence to support the idea that there's a cellular Hmm. memory. Oh, sure, that makes sense. And that maybe things that make us who we are are not just in our brain. Of course, there are people who believe in the existence of a soul Mm -hmm. and the afterlife Mm -hmm. would pretty much expect that the soul would contain at least some essence of our identity. Sure. And as we mentioned before, our identity is very much connected with our memory base. Right. But uh, there are some very uh, interesting, almost too weird of stories about people who have had transplants. Oh, okay. And Like uh, organ transplants. Organ transplants. Mm-hmm. The most notable ones are heart transplants. Mm-hmm. But there are also some stories similar to these on other organ transplants. Mm-hmm. But you know, a heart is a pretty central part of your whole body. So sure. there's a, a book called A Change of Heart. Now, there's dozens of books with this title. Mm-hmm. But it uh, is the story of a woman, Sylvia, who uh, received a heart transplant. After her heart transplant and she had recovered and got kind of back to normal life, she found herself having a strong attraction to beer, chicken nuggets, and green peppers. Oh, interesting. Which were not personal preferences Mm -hmm. in her previous life. Well, in her previous, with her previous heart. Yes, with Mm -hmm. her previous heart. And so they went to the family Hmm. of the heart donor, Mm -hmm. whose name was Tim, I believe. And they confirmed that, yes, those were his favorite foods, Hmm. beer, Chicken nuggets <laughs> and green peppers. You know, where's that coming from? Another story, which it, I, I find even more poignant to a degree, a, a 47-year-old white male factory worker received the heart of a 17-year-old African-American boy. Mm-hmm. And after that, he kind of had this sudden desire to listen to classical music. Oh, interesting. Whereas before, he had pretty much just been like a Mm country-western music listener. Sure. But now he wanted to listen to the great classical Mm. music. And so they found that this boy had died in a car accident Mm. and that he was kind of a prodigy violinist. Oh, interesting. A classical violinist. Mm-hmm. And and he had actually died holding his violin in his arms. And that somehow this this inclination toward a musical style went beyond just whatever caused his musical preference to happen before, which is probably environmental. Mm-hmm. But this had to be genetic to some degree. Mm. I mean, if you're receiving the organ mm-hmm. of someone else, you're, there's a, a gene mixing that must be happening. Sure, yeah. I don't know. Mm-hmm. The 
weirdest story was of an eight-year-old girl who received the heart from a 10-year-old girl who had been murdered. Mm. And after the transplant, this eight-year-old girl had these vivid recurring nightmares Mm. of being stabbed. Mm. And so her mother took her to a psychiatrist who said, I don't think these are dreams. You know, this seems more like actual memories than dreams. So they took her to the police who she described this to them. And because of her description of that recurring memory slash nightmare, they were able to solve the crime and capture uh, the murderer. Wow. Just spooky, weird story. Yeah, and the, my heart wants to say, looking for the happy ending, and the dreams stopped, and she didn't have those memories anymore. Um, I, I don't remember reading that <laughs> or not. <laughs> Poor thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it, I think what it's, it shows is that, you know, we're we're much more than any of us can imagine. Mm-hmm. And and that saying, learn something by heart. Yeah, right. <laughs> you it know, new meaning. May have, may have a greater validity sure. than yeah. what we would normally think of as... You use your brain. You yeah. use your brain. Yeah, but we do it. use our brain. Sure. And, uh, of course, we know that language is one of the most significant ways in which memory and expression mm-hmm. are clearly illustrated Mm -hmm. uh, because we all grow up, almost all people grow up learning a native tongue, a mother tongue. Mm -hmm. And and the reason we learn that is because it's in our environment and it's constant and it's being stored through frequency, intensity, and duration. Mm -hmm. And we we learn not just the vocabulary, not just the grammar of a language, but the very nuance, the dialect, so to speak, Mm -hmm. the way of pronouncing things. In fact... It's funny, uh, I'm sure we've all had this experience of uh, maybe calling someone, uh, and this was in the old days when families had telephones <laughs> rather than individuals, but you know, you call someone and a teenager might answer the phone, mm-hmm. and she sounds just like her mother. Yep. And you're confused, is this her mm-hmm. mother or, or not? Yep. I hear sometimes my children say things And I think, gosh, that sounds just like their mother would Mm -hmm. say that. Mm -hmm. So the nuance is so subtle Mm -hmm. but so powerful. And so we realize then that language is maybe the the most concrete form of memory and expression. We do that with facial expressions. We do it with gestures, you know, the power of environment. But it's the words that enable formal reasoning, right? It, without words, we have impressions, but it's hard. It, it's almost impossible to communicate those impressions. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we could train ourselves in in drawing or painting, maybe, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and communicate it. But in terms of moving into the area of logic, mm-hmm. right? Language is essential. Sure, absolutely. And we also noticed that language and imagination are closely related mm-hmm. because when we hear a combination of words, that goes the reverse direction and paints the picture in our mind. Hmm. Right. So when we read something that's well written, we see more vividly that thing. Yep. And so, you know, in our teaching of writing, I'm I'm very often using our techniques and encouraging students in various ways to apply their imagination to words so that those words then transfer the image, the experience, the idea to someone else. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think about the thing that you have the students do where you tell them, close your eyes and then you walk them through this. So do that right now. For yeah, so it, it's an interesting experiment. So, so usually I do this with story writing. We're mm-hmm. talking about setting. Right, exactly. Right, and this is probably one of the harder things for kids to get, especially, mm-hmm. you know, boys who want to get to the, the action. Right. <laughs> but I say, I'm just going to say some words, mm-hmm. and I want you to see what happens in your mind. Mm-hmm. So I usually do something like this. Close your eyes. House. Two-story. 
forest green, white trim, chimney, beach, sunset, porch, seagulls. Okay, open your eyes. I want to move there. <laughs> well, what, but what happens with each word mm -hmm. is that it adds to mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. clarifies the image. Mm -hmm. And then I point out that creates also a certain mood. You want to move there. It's mm -hmm. peaceful, mm -hmm. tranquil, scenic. Mm -hmm. I could create a different image by saying different words. House, mm -hmm. stone, thicket, brambles, dark, cloudy, howling, Shutter slap, gate creak. Those are just words. Right. And yet those words create an image. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we have memories associated. Mm -hmm. So in our teaching of language arts, we're you know particularly attentive to the expansion of vocabulary because that allows for the expansion of thought right, exactly. in a way. C.S. Lewis made an interesting statement. I, I'm not sure I really understand what it means, but it's interesting <laughs> to contemplate. Okay. He said, reason is the natural order of truth, but imagination is the organ of meaning. So you could have a logical statement or a syllogism, and you could say, I see objectively why that's true. But when we imagine the scenarios, mm. that's when it has a deeper meaning. Mm -hmm. That's when it comes into, into our, our heart, so to yeah. speak. Yeah, that's really good. So why cultivate the memory? Again, getting back to the fact that the combination of kind of progressive modern education that does not value memory mm -hmm. in the same way that people did, say, 150 years ago— mm -hmm. Uh, and then the eclipsing of our memory with technology, yep. why cultivate memory? Well, the first thing is it's a delight. You know, knowing stuff is fun. Mm -hmm. I think that's the basis behind TV quiz shows. I was just thinking Jeopardy. Yeah, how fun Jeopardy it is to, and then who yeah. wants to be a millionaire and you're watching this thing and you're like, I know that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, of course, you know, you're not on the show. You're not going to win any money. And if you were on the show, you probably – they'd ask you a question you don't know. But there's something kind of just enjoyable mm -hmm. about recognizing and knowing things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have now – I'm sure if we were to pull them all out of all the emails and all the letters and all the Facebook posts, hundreds, maybe thousands of – statements by parents about how their children love to recite poetry. Yes. Mm -hmm. I love to recite poetry. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I did an online conference mm -hmm. just yesterday, and it was kind of on this subject of cultivating language skills. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. one uh, of the participants questioned and said, what's the longest poem you've ever memorized? And I confess, it, you know, I have not memorized any truly long poems mm -hmm. like you know, Horatius at the Bridge, mm -hmm. which is 36 stanzas or whatever. And I know children who have done that, mm -hmm. nor have I memorized a whole book of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I've met children who've done that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did get a chance to recite one of my favorite poems, which I learned as a kid and have uh, used spaced repetition. Yes, you know, you use <laughs> reinforcement to say that poem as, you know, as often as I have an excuse so that I don't forget it. And I thought, what a delight mm -hmm. to just be able to say this thing, mm -hmm. have it solid in my memory, mm -hmm. and I hope I you know, can retain it as long as possible. Oh, now, without reciting the whole poem, tell what it is, oh, but we yeah. can put a link to it, because I know we have a link for it, you. It's the embarrassing episode of Little Miss Muffet okay, by great. Guy Wetmore Carroll. Yes. Yeah. Now, we have that one, of course. We, we did that. It's on our YouTube channel. But you also do Jabberwocky. Jabberwocky, Which, yeah. I don't know which one's longer, but you would know. Oh, the embarrassing episode oh, yeah, it's is pretty much funny. longer. Yeah, okay. So, you know, there's, there's that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And then there's not just the joy in knowing it, mm -hmm. but there's an extended joy when you're able to share it mm -hmm. or give it. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite stories of poetry memorization was mm -hmm. this mom. She she drove hours and hours to come to one of my seminars. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, I already watched your thing on video. I just wanted to talk to you. Yeah. I'm like, well, you could have called. Yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted to see you and mm -hmm. tell you the story. It was about her son who at that time 
was 10 years old, mm -hmm. and he was halfway through level three mm -hmm. of our poetry memorization program, which means that if he you know, did it properly and, and retained all of those poems the way you're supposed to, he would have had approximately 50 poems right. memorized and could probably recite any one of those mm -hmm. on demand. I mean, that's quite an achievement. That is quite an achievement. And she said his favorite thing to do was to go to assisted care facility, mm -hmm. a retirement home, and just recite poetry mm -hmm. for the elderly folks yep. there. And, of course, in our program, all of the poems except one are in public domain because mm -hmm. I don't want to pay royalty. Plus, really, <laughs> most of the best poems are the old ones. Mm -hmm. But these are the poems those old folks were learning yes. when they were in school sure. 70, 80 years ago. So, you know, that idea of being able to do it again, to call it to mind, and then to share it is just an intrinsic joy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do we cultivate mm -hmm. memory? Thomas Aquinas quoted Cicero. So they basically said the same thing. I'm assuming it went that way and not the reverse. But, uh, Aquinas put it this way. He said, memory not only arises from nature, but it is aided by art and diligence. So, you know, that's interesting. Again, if we look at the meaning of the words nature, we all have memory. Sure. It's, it's human nature. Mm -hmm. But it is aided by art and diligence. Mm -hmm. Now, what is, what is art and diligence? Well, art essentially is technique, right? Okay. So sure. you think of art— and whether it's, you know, a fine art or a practical art. Painting, dance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's Writing. something that you improve mm -hmm. because you learn technique. You sure. learn, uh, in fact, that the, the Latin is artes and the Greek is techne. Oh, okay. So, oh, interesting. So it's essentially a synonym. Mm -hmm. uh, without technique, art doesn't come out all that great. Right. Right. <laughs> Diligence is uh, derived from the Latin word, uh, Latin verb diligo, mm -hmm. which means to love. Mm. So why are we diligent? Because we engage our heart because yes. we love. And so <clears throat> there's a, a discipline and a practice, mm -hmm. a discipline and a practice. And so what's interesting is that whatever you are, whatever area you're working in, mm -hmm. whether it's dance or music, or language, or foreign language, mm -hmm. the more you have memorized, mm. the easier it is to memorize more. Okay, sure. Right? I can see that. Uh, so, you know, the first Bible verse you memorize, you might it might take you mm -hmm. a, a longer number of repetitions or a, a longer length of time until you can recite that correctly with confidence and not a lot of effort to recall. You know, same thing with music. The mm -hmm. first piece of music you memorize uh, may take you longer. The next one may go a little easier. Right. The next one may go a little easier, and then maybe there's a longer one, so it's a little harder. But, you know, I have seen this uh, remarkable relationship between violin students who had maintained the memorized repertoire and the speed with which they could acquire complete memorization of a new piece versus students who did not, mm -hmm. were not diligent in, in, in keeping that memorized repertoire, and it became increasingly harder mm -hmm. for them to learn new pieces. Okay, so I think of some of my friends who say, I just can't memorize things. It's just, it just doesn't stick. Maybe it's just because they're at the very beginning of their journey, and once they are able to, through frequency, intensity, duration, learn this, it will be easier the next Absolutely. Um, not long ago, Psychology Today reported, essentially, you can improve your working memory. Okay. And they recommended that if you spent 35 minutes a day for five weeks— you would actually improve your working memory, the density of your dopamine receptors, hmm. and even a corresponding increase in IQ. 35 minutes a day for five weeks. That was the article I saw. Okay. Yeah. I like it. It's a challenge. We should make that a challenge. The IEW challenge for this month is 
I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll play with that somehow. Yeah. I think that would be really encouraging because memory is such a part of who we are and what we do. I think it's so important. So I like this idea. Yeah. The, the other thing I always love hearing about is when students come into a new discipline, mm-hmm. for example, chess. There are so many incredible stories of, you know, low-income, minority, mm-hmm. underprivileged, small little groups of kids mm-hmm who get into chess. Mm. Now, part of chess, it's not just strategy, it's knowing what to do because you've memorized patterns. Mm. So if you memorize standard openings, Mm -hmm. you will do better in chess games against people who don't know standard Mm -hmm. openings. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of memory work. Um, there's a lot of uh, visualization that goes. It, it's kind of this all-encompassing thing where there's language and uh, spatial temporal relationships mm-hmm. as well as logical processes and then mm-hmm. holding in your mind. If I do this, she'll do that. So then I could do that and she'd do that, which means I could do that. Mm-hmm. Well, you're you're holding these you know, three, four, five – Things And then you're going, okay, now what if I do this and she does something different, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I love those stories of how chess raises people up Mm -hmm. in both their intellectual capacity to learn other things and then, of course, their sense of accomplishment. Yeah. There's lots of great stories. But, you know, this idea of practicing memory is old as the hills. Sure. (laughs) Um, If you go way back into the ancient times, the rhetoric, uh, the canon of memory, what Mm -hmm. were some of the techniques? That's what I want to know. Okay. Well, probably the most common was the method of loci or loci or loci. It depends on how you would say your Latin. Okay. L-O-C-I, which is, of course, we get the word location from. And uh, you can go, you know, very far back and discover that the idea of attaching certain things to a pathway Hmm. or a building. And so if you're in a building and you say, okay, the first thing I want to say is this idea, and you get an image to go with that idea, and you put it over here on this wall. And then the next thing I want to say, and you get an image to attach to that, and you put it, you know, on that bench over there. And then the next thing I want to to say or remember, you get an image and attach with that and you put that, you know, on the table in front of you. You can fill up the whole room or the whole building. Uh, This is what is often known as the memory palace idea. Mm -hmm. And I've I've seen a number of uh, applications to this, everything from, you know, memorizing all the presidents to – your, your shopping list with 25 different things on it so that when you go to the store, rather than pulling out your list, you just go back to your home and you see all these little things that you've attached to various places in your home. So uh, this is certainly something that anyone who's interested in can research and find out very yeah. easily. Yeah. Uh, there's one book. Um, it's, it's very Catholic, so it might not suit everyone, but I think is the clearest presentation of this idea for a modern audience. And it's just called Memorize the Faith. I don't remember the author right off. I listened to a webinar with him not Mm -hmm. long ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it was remarkable. I uh, used some of this with a group of kids I was teaching. And Mm -hmm. just boom, like in 20 minutes, everybody could close their eyes, visualize this hallway Mm -hmm. and the various things in the hallway that would remind them of the Ten Commandments. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was just like almost instant and somewhat effortless. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> or you can go up and, you know, read much more. Uh, there's a book called The Art of Memory. Uh, it's a big, thick book that goes pretty much through the whole history of memory. Mm. And then one of my favorites is, um, it's called Moonwalking with Einstein. Okay. <laughs> and it's about a journalist who went to cover the National Memory Competition in New York was completely amazed at these remarkable, almost unbelievable feats of memory. And then he interviewed some people. I said, no, it's nothing. You could do it. You just have to practice. So he spent a year doing this 
And then he went to compete and set some new world record – or not a world record, a national record for memorizing decks of cards or okay. something. Uh, but it's a, a, fa- a fascinating idea of mostly a combination of maybe the memory palace plus the idea of attaching unusual or uh, – let me quote Aquinas because you can go all the way back to Thomas Aquinas who said uh, four techniques for improving your memory. Number one – Take some suitable yet unwanted illustration of it, meaning if you want to remember something, create a weird image, Mm -hmm. right, and get that weird image associated with that thing. And then you you can remember a weird image more than a mundane one. Number two, put in order to more easily pass from one to another. So that would be the idea of the memory palace or the pathway Mm -hmm. or the geographical representation of the sequence of Mm -hmm. things. Number three, be anxious and earnest. Repetition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then number four, often reflect on the things we wish to remember. Mm -hmm. Duration. That would Mm -hmm. be, you know, that spaced repetition. Mm -hmm. Well, there's nothing terribly new under the sun. Psychology Today, not too long ago, had an article, Eight Ways to Improve Your Memory. Number one, be interested. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's uh, anxious and earnest. Mm-hmm. Number two, leverage visual memory. Mm-hmm. Same thing, some suitable yet unwanted illustration. Number three, memory tree, branches and leaves. So that's kind of the idea of the method of loci mm-hmm. or loki, how you like to say it, <laughs> uh, where you connect things visually in your mm-hmm. mind. Number four, connect with what you already know. That's using a mnemonic. Mm-hmm. I remember being in Japan, and the the Japanese always used to like to teach people how to say "You're welcome" mm-hmm. in Japanese, which is "Doitashimashite." Right. And if you want to remember "Doitashimashite," you say "Don't touch my mustache." Don't touch my. Well, mustache. that's an easy one, Don't and so you make the transfer. So you mm-hmm. connect with what you already know. Uh, here's something uh, Mortimer Adler was talking about decades ago. I have been talking about it. When reading, annotate yep. or summarize in the margin. Mm-hmm. And that's connected with the number six, which is write out things to be memorized over and over. Mm-hmm. You know, people have criticized um, copywork or workbooks or mm-hmm. those types of things. But honestly, I experienced this studying Japanese. Mm-hmm. If I want to learn a Japanese character, I need to write that character every day for right. weeks or months, right. and then I'll recognize it everywhere. Yep. If I don't write it, I don't remember it. Yep. Uh, number seven, afternoon study is best for most people. That's really interesting. Yeah. And I – not everybody. Right. And I don't know entirely why that's true. But, right. Uh, and then uh, something I've, I've heard in many different places is adequate sleep mm-hmm. solidifies memory. I've seen many studies about mm-hmm. this, that if you nap after you – Uh, study something or if you nap after you practice Mm -hmm. an activity like playing an instrument or Mm -hmm. or something, your sleep state tends to reinforce all that. Right. That's really interesting. And then here's the really good news for many people. This was in Nature Neuroscience. Okay. 2014. Post-study caffeine administration enhances memory consolidation in humans. Okay. So drink more (laughs) coffee. Yeah, I guess in the afternoon. But then that mess with your sleep. Yeah, that's so, a yeah. problem with sleep. <laughs> anyway, I think, uh, you know, we could finish up mm-hmm. with an understanding that there are many virtues connected mm-hmm. with memory, um, the registry of the conscience, Yes. right? How many times do we hear, you know, in Scripture, you know, remember mm-hmm. as a command? Yeah, the whole and, book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy means remember. And, and then yeah. the problem of what happened when people did not remember. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that could be a whole talk right there. So it's a distinctly human faculty, but we also have to remember that memory is not perfect. Right. (laughs) And so many of the things we think we remember may not be exactly the way they were. And it's always interesting with family members. You say, do you remember? No, that didn't happen that way. We were both there. Yes. But our perception is different. So we'll finish up with a quote from Mark Twain. Okay, great. Mark Twain said, now I am grown old and my memory is not as active as it used to be. When I was younger, I could remember anything, whether it had happened or not. (laughs) 
but my faculties are decaying now, and soon I shall be so I cannot remember any but the things that never happened. <laughs> it is sad to go to pieces like this, but we all have to do it. Yes. <laughs> yes, well, the more we can remember, the better. The more human we'll be. I right? think so. Yeah. Well, thank you, Andrew. This has been very helpful. It's fun. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, you can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcast. Until then, on behalf of Andrew Pudua and the team at IEW, I thank you for allowing us to partner with you on your journey toward better listening, speaking, reading, writing, and thinking. Mm-hmm.